But together we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hannah's Fun Curiosity Club, you're all now members, provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual knowledge. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. <laughs> this is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the embodiment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. And now let's give a warm uh, Curiosity Club welcome to Caitlin Porter and Olivia Fabrizio of Grays Harbor Historical Seaboard Authority. Sunday school later on. Now these sails are becoming bleached and just beautifully white, bleached and cleaned by the rain and there's no pollution on there whatsoever. And you should see the, the safety regulations they have on the ship. You know, they've never heard the word. Safety <laughs> is that. Take care of yourself in every case and you'll be all right. And that's what they teach. Now looking down, look at these sails on one mass. Down, down, down. Down, we got sails. Down, down. <laughs> down. <laughs> you can see the ship way down there. Sails, they are what make it all what we make. And with our connection with the uh, elements are through those sails. And I have a few extra pictures of them, but I'm not ashamed of it. The sails are everything. They're our connection. But the fellow on top is simply striking the other fellow down the line. Either one of them is fastened, you say. And I so said, why should you be? Just pay attention. You get a hold of something. And be silly to let go, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Whatsoever. Now, one time I was lecturing in a place where they had a bell. And the bell went on the exactly right. And fortunately, I can't show you the whole thing. So, <laughs> my favorite part, we really wanted to do it. We can do it all right. And this was a little bit of a question. Yeah, we Can you find us with it anywhere else? Sorry. Um, I don't know. I've never been able to find. I just have it because I recorded it to my computer from the one copy we have before the show. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Apparently it's on YouTube. The, the film's called Around Cape Horn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's one I just clipped. Ten days, nothing more than a couple of miles an hour breeze, flat calm here, and uh, even though I'd made all these wishes and all the part of Ireland. But finally it came. It had to eventually and came up with a big blast, sent us scurrying to the sails. There's forty men throwing one sail, a force over here. They're not up there playing tiddly wings. <laughs> and twenty more men out on the port side, body and soul lashings on because the buttons are not strong enough to hold your oysters against the storm. Winds getting up over hundred miles an hour later on. But you put lashings around your waist, around your ankles, around your wrists, around your neck to hold the oilskins out. Not to keep dry, but to keep a little bit warmer. 
and the blast of freezing cold air, snow every month of the year, we get snowball fights around the deck. The two fellows just coming into the picture, at the right here now, are washed overboard uh, off on the way home. That uh, means two empty bucks, and nothing is said about it, it was all very quiet. Now you must be on the ball at all times and get yourself out of the way of a big wave coming roaring across because there's not time for somebody to tell you how to go about it. You wind yourself up on some wire or a, a lifeline that's specially put up there for the purpose from the windward side and otherwise you get bashed away from whatever you're trying to hang on to. Pictures from the top of the mass house, 17 stories high. And when I showed these pictures in London, I lectured to the Alma Company to mass the Mariners, where every single man in the audience was a scurrying skipper, all retired. And they said afterwards, not a man in the audience, and we represent three to 4,000 times around Cape Horn, has ever seen that much water across the deck of a vessel that has not sunk. And we get a copy for the British Museum. So I get a copy in the British Museum. I thought, what can a young fellow do to get something in the British Museum? It's incredible. There's no other pictures taken under these circumstances ever taken and never will. There's no more photos for records. This is storm number two. In between the storms, you set sail. Now you're going to see the, the, the ocean down here in the third zone looking like the bottom of Niagara Falls. The whole water, the water just blowing horizontally now. Just, uh, just, if you can't sit down, going so fast, you're up over 90 now, and the next storm will, will bring it over 100 miles an hour, just screaming, 350 lines, screaming like you never, like, like you're torturing animals to death. The noise was on that six, seven, eight, four, we saw 49 perfect, the buttons had been caught there, but in between the storm, the water, the wind goes down, off into that absolute flat cow. It makes it a very difficult place to sail around, but it's not all storms. Now, nobody writes about smooth water. <laughs> <laughs> now watch this. The bottom of Niagara Falls looks exactly like you're going to see it here in about three or four seconds because the tremendous open part of the sea is shown just tortured. Look, tortured, tortured, tortured. There's that water coming over Niagara Falls. Look at this, the open ocean. The forces involved are fantastic. There's no words that I can use in any language that will tell you what it's like. If you've been there, that's the only way you'll know. Because the forces are beyond anything you've ever experienced or thought was possible. Our lower topsails are built to stand any storm. And yet, we had trouble there too. But the screaming is beyond belief. You don't get up and get out if you hear the noise of that caliber around here. And oh, she is really pumping and straining. The noise of the vessel when you're down inside, groaning one piece against the other. You think it was coming apart, but it's built for Cape Horn and was not about to come apart. And oh, how the chafing and wear and tear, not only on the ship, but on the individuals. The lookout on the deck is back here amidships now. And I'm holding the camera steady with the ship. This is not the way to take it, but I tried it out to see what it looked like. It looks like the ocean is running around. The ship is staying still. Every bar top line is just quivering and screaming. And the lookout at the back here, and I'm on top of the chart house. Now, now the camera's held steady with the horizon, which is the proper day, place, way to take pictures. But to get pictures from down here, when a rogue sea may wipe you off, is just asking for trouble. And then trouble came in a big way. All of a sudden, I was afloat with a smashing crash. Couldn't even shut off the, the camera. As I was not galley west right here. And oh, look at her roll. But that roll wave just had my name on it. And I came within one quarter inch of getting smacked. There she goes, smashed up <laughs> over the side there as it washed off the top of the chart house. But then that's the guy I'm dying to get pictures showing my other part of the brothers and sisters what it's like off the horn. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so everybody wants to sign up now, right? <laughs> <laughs> all an idea of what life could be like on a square rigger. That was in the early 1900s, and the age of sail is regarded as the 1500s to the end of the 1800s. So for hundreds of years, this is how people live on the water. Um, so first of all, what is a tall ship? 
Um, these get polished up all the time, and we just take it for granted that people should know what we're talking about, but that's silly because most people don't know. This is a sailboat, and this is one of the boats that Olivia and I sail on the Lady Washington. It's a tall ship. So you can see there's some differences. <laughs> um, the term tall ship was first mentioned by English poet laureate and sailor John Macefield in his poem Sea Fever which was published in 1902. Um, and we use it today as an umbrella term to describe different kinds of large sailing vessels because they each have their own name. And as you can see from this different uh, chart of different rig types, the term tall ship as an umbrella term is really useful because if I tell you that I sail on a brig or a split topsail sketch or a bark or a fully rigged ship, <laughs> you're not going to know what that means unless you're already a tall ship sailor. So, we use tall ship as kind of the catch-all phrase for all of the boats in the fleet across all the seven seas of the world. Um, so, age of sail. Um, age of sail for Western civilization is, like I said, the 16th to 19th century. Uh, Asia had large sailing vessels a lot earlier. They had them, gosh, like. 2000 BC, I think is the earliest. Uh, China in particular had these enormous junks that were like living civilizations. <laughs> um, so, ancient are the centuries when wind powered ships dominated trade and war, um, and it ended with the advent of steam, like many things ended with the Industrial Revolution. Um, we're going to look at a couple of examples of what people think of when they think of the Age of Sail. The Dutch masters did really beautiful, dramatic, nautical paintings. Uh, this is Lord Horatio Nelson, who was a total badass. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to go back to uh, This is the USS Constitution, Old Ironsides, in the War of 1812, battling the British ship of war, uh, La Guerre, I believe. And I think that was a ship that the British from the French. Um, but the reason why the Constitution is called the Ironsides is in this battle, the British saw their cannonballs actually bouncing off the side of the pole and not going through because the Americans were building really stout ships of war. Um, this is the Raft of the Medusa. It's a painting in the Louvre that I think a lot of people think of. Um, there were something like 160 people lost to the sea when the Medusa sank and 15 of them survived. Um, some fantastic literature. Jack London, The Sea Wolf, Treasure Island is a personal favorite of ours, um, and Moby Dick. And in more modern times, <laughs> people like this man, and even this man. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the amazing thing that we discovered, Olivia and I, about three years ago is that there are still tall ships on the world's oceans today, and you can run them. So, you want to trade me? So, it's not something people see very frequently. I know in Portland there's some sort of big festival that happens, and sometimes tall ships come here. Has anyone seen a tall ship in real life? But, you know, so many things like that. Yeah, yeah, so many. Cool. Um, so these are examples of some of the ships that still sail. There's actually hundreds of sailboats like this tall ship that still exist. They work for different organizations. There are far fewer on uh, the West Coast than there are on the East Coast, and there are even more in Europe. You can imagine why. Most countries have an official tall ship. Uh, the United States official tall ship is. The Eagle, that's our Coast Guard training vessel. Um, so it's a pretty impressive boat in the tall ship community. It's regarded as sort of one of the holy grails of tall ship sailing. Like, oh, you worked on the Eagle, you're kind of a big deal. What are you about to happen or something like that? So this is an example of a sail training vessel. Um, there are other vessels like this one. This is the Europa. This is a boat you would want to crew on, not just for reputation, but because it sails all over the world. It goes to Antarctica. It goes to many islands that have no airports, never have. It's 
incredible uh, adventure. A lot of writers, photographers, that sort of thing get very expensive tickets for this boat and just go around the world, but they accept crew. So if you're crew, you don't have to pay. And that is a for profit organization. This is the Bounty, or no, this is the Pride of Baltimore, I'm sorry. Um, and that is an educational vessel. So that's the other type and the predominant type of publisher that exists now is focusing on sail training and youth educational programs doing living history. This one is a Chesapeake Bay, and they do um, a lot about the history of that area and the Revolutionary War and that sort of thing. Another boat that is a two boats that are part of a nonprofit organization that do educational programming for young people. Our personal favorite boats. The boats we're going to focus a lot of this talk about is the Lady Washington and the Lion Chieftain. Yes, the Lady Washington was a pirate submarine. Mm -hmm. You guys all were really serious. <laughs> <laughs> and those are our favorite boats. That's where we met. That's where we got all our sail training. And they take volunteers with no experience. So you too can work for them for free. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely none. I got on board on the starboard before. Yeah, if you're, if you're 16 and um, mostly able bodied and sort of not insane. <laughs> <laughs> and why? <laughs> well, these are the first things that I thought of when I thought of why I would want to be a conscious sailor adventure, travel. I, Caitlin and I have both sailed the entirety of the West Coast of the United States. Uh, learning a very important, unique skill, writing and rights. That's good. <laughs> um, meeting amazing people like my friend here and here and Captain Rock from there. Um, and forming this, you know, friendship, blah, 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 that sort of thing. Um, also, you can have a career doing it. And you can get nautical tattoos, which is the real reason I'm wrong. <laughs> modern Belgian life, uh, much like around the Cape Horn that we just showed you. We're going to show you a featurette from a film that's not released yet. Um, I spent six months last year on Lady Washington as a purser, and we have this amazing woman come and sail with us. Her name is Marilla Fehe, and she's an Emmy Award-winning documentarian. And she spent a little over a month with us and uh, filmed us and made a documentary about it that I believe is coming out in the spring. It's called The Passage. And so I'm going to show you a secret featurette that she said that we could show. No, Kelly. <laughs> Don't tell us. Should we play that yet? Um, well, yeah, this one I guess didn't get transferred when we transferred the files. Um, I can try to pull it up online really quick. Mm, if we want yeah, to do that. Yeah, sure, if you know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Awkwardly on the drive, right? Um, um, well, it was embedded in the presentation, and it was on my computer. But if you guys will all bear with us, maybe yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the doing right. before the mass training program, and the real reason we have you all uh, trapped in here. The <laughs> <laughs> the building is that we want everyone here to become Welsh sailors. So Caitlin and I, after uh, two and a half years at sea decided that we wanted to help promote the organization that turned us into sailors. So for a while we were working for them doing development work and graphic design and stuff like that. And now we've gone back to the, the life of land lovers and uh, we don't do that anymore, but we're always trying to push this recruitment process because we believe so much in the magic and adventure of college sailing. And once you become a college sailor and you participate in this two-week training program, you can come back whenever you want. And so you have a built-in vacation. No matter where the boat is, you can just go meet up with the boat, get on board, and become crew. Which is one of the coolest parts because when it's in a really awesome location, everybody, of course, wants to get back and forth. So <laughs> in the summer times, they spend several months sailing on San Juan Island and visiting uh, a bunch of different little sail-only islands. And we take families with us, kind of like a summer camp, but not really. We mostly just, just kind of sail the boat. And uh, that, that one is usually pretty, pretty popular. Everybody wants to get on board for the summer. Uh, I think I got it. Okay, so this is Emma's beautiful film that makes our lives look so ridiculously pretty through lighting and background music. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about 
Tell me if anyone can't hear or anything. Yeah, you can just write that. I even have the whole summary. So first contract, I legally signed as an adult. Let's take it on. I have 20 seconds. Nice. That's cool. That's very important. I even have the whole summary of the Puget Sound. Um, so calm waters, calm winds, nothing really going on. I was at the helm steering when we got the course change. Course change. 180. That's the point. Gosh, the ocean. ocean. I'm steering the boat into the Pacific, going due south. It was really cool. It's funny how we have those rites of passage all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a little more violent than most people. <laughs> <laughs> they can be quite, um, quite tests of character. You're coming on the coastline. The intense rain is this fall. It also has a point in time when we were. Doing our lines or something on one of the four pin rails, and there were waves washing across the deck that came up above my waist. So, in that situation, your feet come out from underneath you, just don't don't go over the side. Don't. There's not much you can do with people that. You drill for it, and you left in here in the harbor and you just say, oh, yeah, you know, we can get something back on the board, but out there, you want to get a flood of 20 foot seas. I told my family before I left. If something happens, can I do diet C? No, I died doing exactly what I wanted to right. do. Yeah, I told my parents the same thing. It's lovely to get away, you know, get the boat under, under power, start heading to someplace new. It's just a different change of pace. You know, we're not running around trying to entertain for three hours. We're actually getting the boat somewhere else. You know, it's all about the spirit of, spirit of being American. Now here, you're going to see tons of stars, all the light pollution just dies away. But it's really up here, instead of when we're doing our sails, they can really get to see the boat. I hold my life by my own hands, and if I screw up, that's it. But I also have the power to make my life amazing. Um, and I do the best I can to make it as amazing as I can every day. It's the thrill of like pulling to dock after Uh, and then you work together and 
very many situations during the workday. Your life depends on those people that you live with, and it, you learn very quickly the kind of things that actually really make friendships and the kind of things that really make a person a strong person, somebody you want to live with. And as Olivia said, most of the vessels are run by nonprofits today, um, but there are ones in the navies of different countries. Our organization, Marine Harbor, we do mainly maritime education with more than fifth graders, and then on the weekends, you take people sailing for fun. Um, so you'll you'll do all kinds of different sailing. You'll go offshore. You'll be inland, um, and it's a very camaraderie focused environment. Yeah, so this is, uh, those are whalers. The everybody gets a nickname. This is whaler, <laughs> and those are his feet. And you can see he's standing up on the yard, looking down at the deck. You don't have a lot of photo opportunities like that. You know. So to be special, can you on your uh, skill building? We go ahead and do yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so when you get on board, you're all going to need to know these knots. So we're going to give you a head start, so you'll be ahead of all the other volunteers. So if you look around you on your table, you've been provided with some sheets. And everybody, please take one, pass these around. And you have a line to practice with. You have a dowel, if you find that to be handy. Absolutely. And uh, this, this uh, young man here, and Rob, if you they're going to come around and help you. And if you have any questions, Caitlin and I were happy to help as well. These are the kind of essential knots that people talk about. There are a couple more on the sheet, but instead of slow pitch, you've got your rolling hitch. Now, rolling hitches are perfect for making forks and putting up carts when you're camping. It's one of my favorite knots. It's the knot that's holding this sail up right now. It's, uh, and then you've got the sheet end that's good for tying two lines together of different widths. And then you have your bowling. Now that's, I think, the most interesting knot of all time. It's hundreds of years old. You've seen a captain lift an 800-pound generator into the air with Mr. Boland. Uh, and also, there is evidence that the Boland has been around since 2500 BC. They found one on a pharaoh's uh, sunship. So there's evidence of the Boland existing in many different cultures. It's so helpful because it's easy to undo even after you've had all that weight on it. That's one of the tricky parts. When you tie a knot and then you put weight on it and then you get try to get it undone, it can be difficult. The bowline can be broken. It's called breaking the back of the bowline and undone once you have uh, finished what you were doing. So this is a little uh, trick that some people find helpful. You can read that. Um, so and experts like this guy right there, we have a special seat in those boxes on the table if you open those up. We're not kind of experts, we have a little challenge inside that box. So go ahead and yeah. The cigar box oh. is the most important one. Okay, so if anyone wants to see a bowl and done, uh, we have all kinds of little uh, helpful bird puzzles that we say. But one of them is to make like a rabbit hole. And the important part is that uh, the end that you're using to tie the knot, so this is going to be my working end, that needs to be on top. If you guys can see that that's on top. Okay, so you've got your rabbit hole. Um, and then the bunny is going to come out of the hole. <laughs> it's kind of hard to show, hopefully you guys can. So, rabbit hole, bunny comes out, goes around the tree, and back into its hole. And then you cinch that down and you have a bowl. And <laughs> you can also say the sailor goes into the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that one's really easy because you just take your two better ends um, and you go, I'm going to go facing me, but you go right over left and you tie it like you're going to tie your shoes. 
Wait, wait. <laughs> so you start like behind your shoes, and then you're going to do the opposite. Instead of right and left, you're going to go left over right. Okay. And then you have your square knot. Or if not, just be followed on the if anyone wants to try a certain knot and is having trouble, let us know. Perfect. Okay, so you've got your rabbit feet, and so the bunny is going to come out, go around the tree, and back in the water. Yeah. And, then you and that one, like, if you learn just those four knots, you're going to be able to get the rest of us to do it again. You can do it any place in your house. The dolls are for to try a rolling hitch or a flipping hitch if you want to do that. Yeah, so like, 
<laughs> and let's see. Oh, this one's good. The rig. Tyler's rig because my rig is, is um, leaves something to be desired at the time. Uh, so you've got your rig. It's leather. He made him his himself. Got this because anybody have any ideas why you want to put a lanyard on here? Tie it to yourself. Don't want it to fall off. And when you go aloft, which is up in the sails, everything on you becomes a weapon. <laughs> and we have a rule on the boat that if anything falls off of you from aloft, sunglasses, a hat, a lighter, you owe everybody on the boat ice cream. Everyone. All the time. And we enforce that rule. So this is a rig. Everybody wears theirs all day, every day. Some people even wear it when we go into town. It's kind of upsetting when you realize you're with 15 people who are all wearing mines on the outside of them, and you're in strange place. <laughs> yeah. So within the rig is the Marlin Spike. It's called the Marlin Spike because it used to actually be made from the nose of a Marlin fish. Now they're made from metal. That's because we work with things like shackles now. And uh, if your shackle gets stuck, you put this in the shackle, and you yank on it, and it undoes the shackle which is very, very helpful. Also, when we were talking about the bullet, and I mentioned that the one nice thing was that it came undone easily. Not all knots do that. Very few knots actually do that. But this helps you undo your knot easily, but it does damage the line a little bit. So, and then the coolest part about the rig is the knife. Sailors, of course, are really um, <laughs> a source of pride. Your knife is important. It talks, it says who you are, and people spend lots of money on their knives. And you'll notice that this has a flat tip. That's because traditionally, captains would have all the sailors grind down the tip of their knife when they got on the boat. Why might that be a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> so you don't stab each other, so you don't stab the captain. Oh. Just people don't stab the captain. Also, you know, you gotta really wanna be in a fight if you're gonna slice somebody with that. Also, stabbing yourself happens a lot more than you think. And accidentally, of course. So he would grind down the tip of uh, the knives when sailors would get on board. And so we still do that, um, mostly just the stabbing yourself accidentally when you're <laughs> a fine horse or something, not so much the mutiny or uh, sailor fights. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, this is my ring. My lanyards aren't totally attached, but um, this is uh, some people put a lot of time and energy into making their lanyards fancy. Uh, some people. And so mine is really fancy. I haven't actually fully attached it um, to it, but that's all right. And then what do we have next? Oh, steam rubber. This is something that is still really useful. Uh, I made mine out of I think, cherry, so it's mostly just a hardwood. Or in this case, it's, it's a really nice piece of whalebone that they did a really nice screenshot on because you have lots of time at sea to do things like that. So, you know, it's really. Pretty obvious because when you're working with canvas, again, really heavy, you use this to flatten your seam and smooth it down so that you can work with it and stitch it. It works well on your hands. And then we have the serving mallet. I don't have a serving mallet. Not that I haven't done a lot of serving, because you do a lot of serving on the boat. You can see how this is strengthening the core of the line. You can see the cross section here. The line goes through there. You wrap it with canvas, you put a bunch of tar on it, and then you wrap this with the same twine, which is another special type of, of line we use on the boat, and then wrap it tightly around, and that is on all boats, even now, all the steel rigging, everything is served up, usually if somebody takes care of their boat. It lengthens the lifespan of your, your wire or your line or anything by years and years and keeps everybody remarkably safe. It's also the most annoying thing to have to do on a boat after <laughs> uh, And so that same twine I was speaking of is another thing to so keep in there. Okay, same line. Smells really nice. Like a uh, tar. <laughs> like too. People want to see what that looks like. Um, that's a nylon fiber, same line. Uh, originally, they would use a natural fiber, usually hemp or something like that. And they tar it to make it waterproof and resistant and all that sort of thing. Is it named after the river? Um, it is actually. I don't believe it is named after the river, same. But uh, same nets are named after the line. So uh, if you hear about the same net, it's because those lines, the, those nets would be woven with same twine by the fishermen originally. Of course, they don't have to do that anymore. And then this is sail thread. This is um, just 
what we were going to feel a lot like dental floss. This is wax coated because I'm lazy and I don't want to coat it myself. Some people have wax of wax and they run the line through as they stitch their canvas, which I think is actually more effective, but this is pretty waxy. So it works for me. Uh, so those are some of the things. I have some more modern stuff in here too, like a, a carabiners for emergency Caribbean situations, extra tough knives, a pouch for carrying things a lot, which is really helpful because you have all this stuff tied to you, you start running out of places to put things. Um, let's see, more knives. <laughs> And ooh, a leather punch. Yeah, they didn't have those in the 1700s. Very helpful. Then going around with all the punch all the way my house. Ball and hammer. And then a Marlin spike I made out of a railroad chest. <laughs> and then some shackles and stuff. Oh, and then a sail punch. This is for punching holes in the sail. I did this this afternoon, actually. Uh, you can see where the grommets are at the top of the sail. They're the little brass shiny things. To put those in, first you have a, to punch a hole in the canvas. This is very helpful for that activity. Okay, so this is just some of the stuff that sailors would work with. Um, there's a whole culture that exists on the boats in free time that you have. Nowadays, you have this free time because you are in a small town on the Oregon coast and there's nothing within 15 miles of you and you don't have a car. So everyone develops these little hobbies, some of which are decorating their tools or Singing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which brings me to the arts of a sailor. Um, <laughs> so we're just going to kind of talk about some of the cultural things that evolved on board to the age of sail um, that we still try to keep alive today on board the boats. Um, the first one is sea shanties. Has anyone heard of sea shanties before? Gosh. Cool. Okay, so we do see them a little bit here and there influencing modern, modern music, but it's basically a genre of working music um, that developed on board the boats. And they were largely improvised sailors. They, it was an oral tradition, so a, sailor, a new sailor would come on board, the frigate he worked on, and he would know a new pull of the song or something. So it's for the kinds of labor on board that are really monotonous. Um, and also helping the sailors keep time together. So if you're all hauling away on a line, if you're singing and the chorus, the beat of the song, is you'll coordinate your pulling together. And there's also capstans, if you want to go back one slide. The capstan that this guy's standing on, um, these have bars that go into them, so the sailors will walk around it and push on the bar and just go in a circle. And so the capstan songs are slower and just kind of more like we're going to be here for a while. So <laughs> <laughs> um, shanties in modern music. Uh, if anyone is a fan of English folk rock from the 60s, <laughs> um, bands like uh, Fairport Convention and Seal Ice Band did a lot to bring back shanties to the general population. Um, I really enjoy their shanties. And then this band, some of you might recognize the Decemberists from Portland, Oregon. Uh, they're our personal favorite of all the sailors um, because a lot of their music is not to be themed and influenced, and they even write their own shanties, like Mariner's Revenge. Um, so I do have an example of an old shanty, uh, just to give you guys an idea. And all the old recordings, uh, or all the recordings of what's supposed to be old style shanties, are. I don't know if I have that look anywhere, actually. Shoot. Crown? Um, well, I know exactly how to get to it. I go to Amazon, and I type shanties. <laughs> so all of these ones that, are, that you get examples of are like all these men singing perfectly in a cappella chorus. <laughs> like this. I don't think this is actually what Sailor sounded like ever. Um, very nice, but I think realistically it sounded more like how it sounds today on board our boats, which is people who can barely sing, trying to hold it together to not just totally upset all of our passengers, <laughs> missing of notes and whatnot. Um, and so, and then uh, one of the captains that we've worked with.
This is his band. He loves shanties. And, oh shoot, I don't think. Well, I will show that to you later if you are interested. Anyways, um, but he does like a rock sort of, they're pretty traditional, but it's like also infused with rock. Um, and so we still have shanties today, people are still working with the music, it's still changing, which is how it always was, you know, the sailors would imp imp improvise a new verse, uh, make something new, and we're still doing that today. So that is sea shanties. LA, slideshow. <laughs> we planned for too many media types, I think. Oh. And those play. And Great play for more. Oh, that's a little impressed though. Okay. This is what happens when you live on a boat for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I can navigate it for you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, there we go. So the other one that happened on whaling ships was scrimshaw, and we've already mentioned this a couple of times, and it's carving on pieces of bone. Uh, some of, depending on the kind of ship you were on, like if you were on a navy ship, you weren't going to be given downtime, there's always a job you could be doing. The whaling ships would be out at sea without a destination, they'd just be waiting to find whales. So they actually did have lots of time, and they were run in a militaristic style, um, so it was just a bunch of dudes on a boat waiting for whales. So that, <laughs> that combined with having bones laying around their boat, somebody figured out that they could basically engrave them. So scratch in a design and then put in um, tar or tobacco or whatever they had to dunk in it. Um, so this, this is actually a historic example of Scrimshaw. We can go to the next one. As of this top left one, um, whale that was caught near the Galapagos Islands by the crew of the ship Adam and made 100 barrels of oil in the year 19, or 1817. Pardon me. Um, so I've seen some really detailed ones that you can find really beautiful, really detailed work. Um, I'm sure there were plenty of really crude ones too, but most of the Maritime Museums hang on to beautiful ones. <laughs> this is an example of fake shot from the Oxnard Maritime Museum. Um, it's a fake, huge tortoise shell with scrimshaw. And then this is uh, some modern scrimshaw, this is made on the right. Um, there's a few uh, scrim shanders, is actually what scrimshaw artists are called still working today. There's a woman that I met at San Diego at the Festival of Sail that does scrimshaw on ostrich eggs and like all kinds of really interesting things like that. And it's uh, also really helpful for us historically because a lot of the old images and only existing images of some ships and some uh, original meetings between cultures survived the ages because it was scrimshaw and not a painting or a drawing on paper. So a lot of the first and original paintings we've seen come from Scrimshaw. So it, it, it added a lot to the, our understanding of the history of that time. So, Which brings us to personal Scrimshaw. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very favorite pastime for sailors, of course. I don't personally have any values, but um, this fellow does. And <laughs> his tattoos mean something to him and is important. This is something that occurs a lot with college sailors after they get off the boat and they see someone in the street who has a nautical star or a fully rigged ship, which is what we call a piece like this one here, like the full ship, and you get very excited. They're a sailor, they've accomplished these things. We're probably going to be friends and run up to them and you say things like, You've been around Cape Horn? And they say, What are you talking about? <laughs> because not a lot of people have actually sailed around Cape Horn. Recently, especially. So each tattoo has its own meaning. Uh, this is one of our crewmates, and he has a very popular uh, sailor tattoo of the swallows. The swallows migrate um, thousands of miles every year, so the swallow is a symbol of 5,000 nautical miles. So if you see somebody with a swallow, just the one, it means they've gotten to the 5,000 mark. He's got two because he's got 10,000 miles. And um, in the middle is a, a rig knife and a marlin spike, and then. And not <coughs> uh, so that's one of the favorites. 
Old fast, and this is a really got to be dedicated to a life of uh, sailing if you want to get old fast tattooed on your knuckles. That is just a reference to not falling from a loft back when there wasn't any safety gear. You you know, it'd be silly to let go. So maybe a helpful <laughs> reminder, I guess, if you really need one. What am I supposed to do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the rooster and the pig, this is a really popular one as well. This is a couple of different historical references. The idea is that if you have a rooster and a pig tattooed on your feet, you won't drown in a shipwreck because the fowl and the, the um, Pigs were having crates on boats, and so they would float after the boat sank in their own personal little boat and arrive at the shore of the next island or wherever. So a lot of times, they would be the only survivors of shipwrecks. So it was supposed to be a good luck sign. Also, there's a saying, you know, and then you'll always have bacon and eggs, and it'll bring you luck. And there's also something about it helping you with, with fighting. Who's here that is all right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of our uh, um, sailors and friends have a lot of these tattoos, so the tradition is definitely being kept alive in case you are all worried. <laughs> nautical star, very popular. Um, nautical tattoo. It doesn't have any specific meaning, and I really looked into this for this presentation to see what it was. It's just a good luck thing. It's just we navigate using the North Star, celestial navigation, it's still talk when everyone gets their patent license. Uh, for a large enough boat, you learn celestial navigation in case all your systems go out. And it's a try and true way to go around the world. So it's just a good luck symbol. It has no specific meaning. Uh, similar with the, the compass rose, also doesn't have a specific meaning. It's so a good luck. And that dates way back to the Celts, uh, who were one of the first recorded cultures to have compasses on their, on their vessels carved in. And this is the fully rigged ship that I was talking about. And that means you sail around Cape Horn like. Uh, Irving Johnson in that video earlier, which is a big accomplishment. Even in a car container ship, I guess you wouldn't really have to do that in the car view. But uh, so this is an older version. You see he has swallows too, and mermaids. The mermaids are also just good luck as well. But yeah, so there's a lot of meaningful ones. There's the dragon, that means you've been to China. Um, a lot of pornographic tattoos. That was very popular to like, with them all the time. And the sea turtle is crossing the river. Yeah, and the anchor is crossing the Atlantic. A fouled anchor means that that also, yeah. And then there's one that means you're never turning sea. A cross anchor means that you're a bosun's mate. So there's, there's lots of them. So make sure to heckle everyone really bad if you see them with an article tattoo. Get them to tell you their sea stories. Okay, so for the last section of our presentation, and maybe we'll if you could fill the ladder for us. Um, Switching the stick back and forth. 
that's the first time I saw it. I was standing watch at night, and it was my first transit, and I was like, oh no, I'm like seeing things. Because <laughs> <laughs> our wings were flowing, and I was really tired. <laughs> that was the side effect of being in Baltimore. <laughs> um, wildlife. You get a very close up view of wild animals on the ocean. Uh, this is a very common sight, actually, on a tall ship dolphins playing at your bow. Um, and it never gets old. Some sail is something known to climb down into this. We call this the sailor strainer, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, so they would climb down into the sailor strainer and try to catch the dolphins. And I think now somebody succeeded at that once. And it was on a, a videotape. I think you might have gotten in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Not supposed to touch the dolphins. Oh, yeah, this is a really big plus that we haven't mentioned yet. Most of these historic sailing vessels still have cannons on them. We call them guns because the cannon is something on land. We put a cannon on a ship and it's a dead gun. Not a cannon, just so nobody gets confused when they're loading things onto the, the ship. And they all work, so we get to play with black powder all the time. Uh, her and I have both been gunners, which means you get to be in charge of loading uh, the guns and firing them at the other boat, which is really fun. We have battle tales between the lady and the chieftain. We go out, we turn off our engines, and our captains try to outmaneuver each other, which is sometimes terrifying and results in the engines being turned back on very quickly to so back off the other boat. And uh, we, we shoot. Uh, everything you need, really, to fire something at them, just no, no projectile. But it has happened that once at sea, a tall ship, not ours, of course, fired a fishing weight with the hook sanded off, which is very similar to a cannonball. Wow. Uh, they just put it in after you put the black powder in, and light it like you normally would, and you have a projectile. So we. Uh, we know it works, <laughs> but we don't do that. But we don't do that. <laughs> um, so this is a comic of our friend Lucy Bellwood. She lives in Portland, too. Yeah, she's a Portland artist. And if you get a chance, we brought a couple of her comics. She does comics about life aboard modern tall ships. She first started sailing on Lady Washington. And her art is beautiful, and we really like these frames. It says, She's seeing the lady Washington for the first time, and it says, wow, she's beautiful. Suddenly, I got it. All the songs, the books, the myths, the stories, they all made sense in that moment. It was love at first sight, and it was real, which is the way that I think most of us feel about these books. Um, so if you get a chance, definitely check these out, because they kind of give you a glimpse into what your first two weeks on the boat will be like. Um, that's how long our training program is on the Grays Harbor boats, two weeks. So if you can get away from your obligations for that long, you can try out being a tall ship sailor. Um, the requirements to do so. <laughs> um, do you want to cover these? Oh, yeah. yeah, you have to, like I said earlier, be at least 16 years old. And we're actually flexible with that, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, ability to work well with others. That's also something we're flexible about. <laughs> An interest in learning new things. Hopefully you are here, so I don't even need to say anything about that to you guys. A stomach for adventure, and you have to be the right kind of crazy because we will ask you to do crazy things. <laughs> and so that's sort of important <laughs> to have a little bit of that. Too much logic, you shouldn't be on a square with a ship. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We have, if anyone has heard enough and definitely wants to sign up, we actually brought the paperwork with us. <laughs> so you could be on board in two weeks from now. Or maybe even tomorrow, but not the open slots are like right now. They're in Hood River right now, too, aren't they? Are they still here? They yeah. Have, yeah. So they like the locks? Uh, they haven't yet. Wow. They will. We actually, yeah, we have to downrig the top masts of both mm -hmm. of the ships, which means climbing up there. Hooking everything up so it doesn't just crumble apart, taking it apart, lowering it to deck, having your crewmates catch it, and not catch it, but receive it and put it down and put it away so we can go under those bridges. And then on the way back out, we have to do it again, put it back up. And we have to do it while the boat's moving. Special challenge. <laughs> yeah, so on Lady, the top, just the very top of the gallant sails, which are the highest up sails, will come down, and then Lady's masts are in three sections. So we'll bring down the top 
to gallon sales, and then the top part of the mast went to gallon mast. So it's a big project. But the bridges are too low for us, so we have to do it. Um, and to wrap up almost our presentation, we've got one more activity for you guys. It's going to be fun. But first, the disclaimer. We are not responsible for the results of going to sea, included but not limited to. Loss of ability to hold down a 9 to 5 job. Sunburn, sunglasses, hand. Um, loss of ability to stay in one place for any length of time. Stress on relationships due to obsessive use of unintelligible language and referencing of things, people, and places unknown to lovers. <laughs> when you get back from sailing, you want to tell all of your best friends and have like every waking moment of your experience at sea, and you can see their eyes start to glaze over after a while of enough of them saying, and then it was on the topsail yard, and the flip rope was getting like pushed up under the yard, so my legs were getting crushed, and blah, blah, blah. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so be sure, one piece of advice I will give you is if you go to sea, be sure to call your friends and family, because even though you're on a boat having adventures, they're still at home wondering why you're never calling. <laughs> also, we're in appropriate year. We have so many people show up being like, I have lots of wool. Uh, you know, you're going to get, like, sometimes you just have to stand in the rain for four hours and it's pouring, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to stand there. If you don't bring the right rain here, you're, you're in trouble. That first transit is always really dangerous for the new people because they refuse to admit that they need extreme weather gear. Or don't know. Or, yeah. I mean, you're, it's not like rain code, like, I have a nice windbreaker style. You need offshore gear. Um, and Tyler <laughs> is going to do some modeling for us of the kind of appropriate gear we're talking about. It's, and it's, it's even it's not even things you can find. Somebody says I'm bringing my snowboarding jacket. That's not gonna that's gonna get drenched, and then you're gonna be standing in your wet snowboarding jacket for the next three hours. That's not my plot. So if you guys decide to sign up and you want to try it out, we'd be happy to make presentations on the back. Yeah. Um, Did we write the current back in the book? Yes, it is. That's good. That's good. So you have. Uh, I'd recommend putting on your bibs first. Oh, no. You have bibs, which are waterproof overalls. Um, these are mine, so they're a little small for Tyler, but we're going to be um, And so they have the advantage, they have um, tabs on the bottom so you can tighten them around so we're going to see water coming up and in your pants and in your boots. My very first transit, I did not know that you shouldn't tuck your fan legs into your boots. And I did that, and then I went out on the bow, which is the front of the boat, where that sailor's trainer is that I told you about before. And as I was trying to secure a sail because the sail had come loose. If the sail stays loose, it will pillow out and it will catch water, and the front of the boat will no longer come back out of the water as it plunges and your boat sink. So we had to go secure the sail. And I didn't tuck my, my boots in my pants, and I got out there, and uh, we're going underwater. You have to hold your breath and go, go down. And my boots filled with water and started to come off and anger me and like pull me through. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Come on, I just tucked them in there. Yeah, I said. But then also, little mistakes like that. <laughs> <laughs> little trouble. That looks comfy. Yeah. <laughs> and now, maybe you put on your extra tops. Oh, so, you may see these on shows like the Big Catch. These are the most fashionable footwear for sailors. <laughs> um, they have new pinning soles, and they last pretty good. You can wear them in the rig, they've got a heel and everything, and then you don't slip out. The rig is all hard. <laughs> and keep in mind if you're standing, watch. If you have to use the restroom, you do have to get out of these and in order to do that. You have a harness as well. Yeah, you're also wearing a climbing harness, and also your watch leader wants you back on deck in three minutes. <laughs> We do wear a Basically, yeah. okay. if you're just standing there, you just plug in usually. If it's really bad, yeah. Um, like, 
our friend Rangy was uh, on the Hawaiian Chieftain, and they got a big wave. And he was actually facing aft the back of the boat. So he was looking at the person steering at the ship's wheel. And they were like, Rangy, hang on. And so he really quickly just clipped his carabiner that was attached to the lanyard on his harness to the top of the alley house. And then he said he was just immediately underwater, like two seconds <laughs> after they got it. That's like pretty extreme though. Like we, most of our transits are fine, but the weather can get like that. So now, what about your float coat, Tyler? Uh, this is yours, so you can say whatever you want about it. This is a float coat. Um, it is a type 3 BFD. Um, it is anti hypothermic and it is a, basically a built in life jacket, um, warm jacket. You think they want to make it something other than the color of water? <laughs> now they do. This one, so they can see you when you go overboard. Which you don't do. <laughs> Maybe you should test it. Yeah. Maybe you should test it. Maybe you should test it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you would like to report to the uh, other side of the window, there's a Washington is 
she retired before she discovered Tall Ship, and she's been on for months. She loves it. You saw her talking in that movie. She was the one saying she wasn't an adrenaline junkie. Uh, junkie. I heard her name far, and we love her to death. She's a book on. Yeah, she's the current first mate of Lee, and she said that if you're seriously considering coming aboard, please work on your pull-ups and your knots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, can I just grab a little bit? Yeah. Here I go. So, uh, two questions. First is, I guess if you get fed on these voyages, you have to bring your own food. Catch your own. Oh, there's, okay. <laughs> there's a ship's cook on each vessel, so you don't even have to think about feeding yourself. Mm. So people, you, your captain tells you when you'll wake up, the cook wakes you up, you get out of bed, you eat breakfast, the bosun tells you what to work on, and then the cook calls lunchtime, the bosun tells you what to work on again, the cook calls dinner time, and then the captain stands you down for the evening and you're done working at usually about 6 all you have to do is decide what you're going to drink after stand down. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of your life is dictated to you. It's actually really great. <laughs> 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 what's, awesome. what's the other question? The other question was about that rope hammer. The serving, the serving mallet. mallet? Yeah, the serving mallet. What the hell, What? What? why would you need a mallet in the middle of your rope? Uh, well, it tensions the same twine that you're using, so the way that the same twine is wrapped around it actually is specific to keep tension on it. Yeah. So as you're twisting the mallet around to lay the same twine on oh. the bigger piece so of the So it's just a tool you use to basically yeah. uh -huh. it. Okay. it just weaves okay. around it, and if you're like super cool, you have a self-tending uh, serving mallet. Which is a big mallet with like usually like a piece of coat hanger, so you can actually put the, <laughs> the reel of same twine on it. And then you can stretch out the line like from me to Tyler that we want to serve. And Olivia would put the mallet on, and then we bounce it, and the mallet bounces and spins and oh. serves the line. Um, and that's like everybody wants to know that. Cool. Yeah. Um, it can't be possible that. And you guys has personified the stereotypical sailor of old. I'm sure those stereotypes don't hold water today, right? I mean, there's not a lot of drinking in, in the boats. <laughs> <laughs> there's not a lot of staying out till four in the morning and then crashing for two hours. So if you were 21 of old, or older, we do like to go to sing shanties. And uh, we've got kind of our spots on the West Coast. Uh, sailors. Everything we go to pretty much is a marina, so there will be like sailor bars. One of our favorites is uh, Jack London, uh, or Jack London Square. Jack London Square in Oakland, there's a bar called Heinhold's First and Last Chance, and it's built from the lumber of a whaling ship, um, and it was a bunkhouse for sailors back in the late 1800s. It's arguably one of the oldest remaining that, bars in California. That one's cool, but like a block away. She's in a shadier bar for the <laughs> merchants. And that is my. Everybody likes merchants. But I know it's safety there in time to screw. And you'd be surprised how quickly people will buy you drinks to get you to stop singing. It's a shame. Does anybody else have questions? Like, how long, how long is it safe to stay in place? Right. Um, it depends on the vessel you're on. Uh, like Europa, that big uh, bark that we were talking about. That one, they pretty much are at sea all the time. Like, we know a crew member who works on that boat, and he says, like, they stop in the port just to, like, take on provisions and passengers, um, and they go to Antarctica. So, on a boat like that, you get tons of blue, blue water sailing, um, and that's more like the lifestyle of the first video that we played um, yeah. around Cape Horn. Um, and then our vessels, and vessels like ours that do education programs, our mission is to be in port taking kids sailing and teaching them about their maritime heritage. Yeah. Uh, so the longest transit I've been on was eight days. Uh, and transit is what we call going from one port to another. So that was Sacramento, California to San Diego, California. Um, and we had some rough weather there, so it took us a while to, to go down there. So then follow up. Uh, if you are significantly injured or you get scurvy, like, <laughs> 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 what is the, what is the, what is the, can be done about it? 
Like if we get really badly cut and we're like, oh, oh that's so much. Yeah, cool. well, Should we you have, have if you have a 500 times tax license, you have been trained to be able to perform a lot of emergency medical procedures, or you've been instructed as how you do that on phone with a doctor. If we're out of cellular range, which happens really fast, you usually have a medical officer on board, which can be somebody who has lots of medical experience, you know, wilderness training, sometimes we have people who are EMTs and they'll be the medical officer, and sometimes we have uh, people like me who is pre-med in mostly genetics who was medical officer. I had no idea what to do in an emergency situation. Actually, that is a, one of the things we're working on for the boats is raising money to provide better offshore um, catastrophe supplies because one of the problems with our boats is the Coast Guard can't get close to us on helicopters because we have all that stuff in the air. The helicopters can't come to us and drop a basket down. In fact, they try to avoid the boat as it's moving back and forth through the water. So we have to literally put the injured person in the water, in a life raft, and in the Pacific Ocean, that's how it's very cold, and get them to an area where the helicopter can then do a pickup. Hopefully, the seas are calm enough that you can do that safely. So that is so, definitely a point of concern. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> our biggest thing is that we just try to prevent injury. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be really great. And uh, let's get another round of applause. 